Okay, uh, let's bring this meeting to order. Is there any additions or changes to the agenda as presented? And the only item on the agenda is the informational meeting. And I'm looking at board members. I do not see anyone waving. So we'll move on to the first item. Dave, it's over to you. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, let me start, Brian. Are you going to uh, knock down some microphones here? You're going to just going to leave them open. Uh, right now, we've got just board members open. Um, right. Okay. That's what. That's what my uh, my understanding was. So, okay. yeah, I'm ready to go. Okay. Welcome to the Town of Johnson informational meeting for 2021. Uh, my name is David Williams. I'm moderator of the Town of Johnson. And uh, I will rec be recognizing folks who wish to address the meeting and trying to fulfill the purpose of the meeting. And the purpose of the meeting is to review and solicit questions and comments regarding items on the Town of Johnson Annual Town Meeting Warning, which will be voted upon by Australian ballot on March the 2nd, 2021. Um, the, uh, the warning of this meeting uh, is available uh, online. Uh, and the material that we're going to be discussing is also available on the ballots which have been sent out to uh, all of the uh, registered voters of the town of Johnson. This is kind of plowing gr the same ground for a number of you who are in on the candidates night, but uh, there are some folks who are here that weren't there. So uh, there are two ways in which folks can uh, participate in this meeting. Uh, one is uh, by means of this Zoom connection, and there should be on your screen somewhere a, a block of generally white. It's usually on the right-hand side, and somewhere on there, there's a little blue hand. And if you click on the blue hand on the right of your computer screen, uh, and you wait to be recognized by the moderator, uh, then you can participate that way. Uh, I've seen some folks who are uh, participating by telephone. And if you want to be recognized uh, to speak, uh, you should dial star nine uh, and wait to be recognized. And once you're recognized, then you should uh, <clears throat> dial 
uh, star six, and that will open your microphone so we can all hear what you have to say. On the off chance that uh, you didn't get to tidy up the room that uh, this camera is in your house, or you just discovered you weren't wearing the outfit you intended to wear to this, <laughs> this important meeting, uh, you have the option of going down to the bottom and uh, turning the, the uh, camera off. Uh, our ringmaster today is uh, Brian Story, our town administrator. Uh, he has muted all microphones except for those of the moderator and the select board members. Uh, he will be keeping track of those who are requesting recognition. And he will tell me who is next to speak and will then unmute the microphone of the participant who has been recognized by the moderator. There will probably be a small delay between my recognition of the speaker and the unmuting of the speaker's mic, so be patient. Uh, if you do use the blue hand and uh, you've, not, you've been waiting for a while and you haven't been recognized, it's because there are others who have requested recognition in front of you, uh, let's say before you did. If you continue to cl click on the blue hand, I want to stress this. The Zoom program, not Brian, not me, not anybody else, the program will erase your initial request and relegate you to the most recent click of that blue hand button. Um, each time you're recognized, whether by the blue hand or the telephone, please identify yourself to the record uh, as the, the um, minutes of this meeting are required to be accurate and we have to know who is speaking. I, I was a little lax on that during the candidates forum because mostly I was simply directing and calling on one or another of the candidates to uh, by name to respond. Uh, that won't be the case here, so please identify yourself. Um, I request you to try to limit your question or comment to, to under three minutes. If you need more time, let me know. I'll, I'll more likely not give you more time, uh, but we, you know, we don't want um, monologues. Uh, we, we want some kind of exchange going here. I want to stress that this is an informational meeting and not a town meeting. The articles that we're going to discuss tonight uh, cannot be amended. They can't be voted on or voted down or voted anyway uh, in an informational meeting. Each of the 12 articles we will discuss will be decided by the votes which are cast on May 2nd. Additionally, I've asked the uh, select board chair uh, first to introduce and explain the proposed budget, which is Article 3, uh, and questions and comments will follow his presentation. Uh, next, I'm going to invite uh, comments on Articles 4, 5, uh, 6, 7, and 8. Those are the uh, charitable entity contribution articles. I'm going to take them as a group uh, such that you can address all of them if you want or individual uh, requests uh, at the speaker's option. Um, next, I will invite questions and comments on Article 9, the tax collection article. I may be very surprised, but I doubt there's a tremendous interest in, in the wording of that, uh, that article, but time will tell. Uh, next, we're going to go on to Articles uh, 10 and 11, the cannabis articles. We'll discuss them as a piece. Uh, Next, Article 12, the town village merger discussions will discuss um, on, on its own. Uh, and then uh, Articles 13 and 14, the ATV ordinance and impact study articles, and uh, we'll discuss them as a single unit. Finally, if we have the time and energy, I'll invite any other comments concerning town matters not previously discussed. And really, finally, uh, unlike some Vermont towns, Johnson has a long and well-earned reputation for conducting its town meetings in an open and civil manner. Um, we can and do discuss difficult issues, issues about which various community members have strong and sincerely held differences of opinion. That we do this in a way that respects the dig dignity and worthiness of those with whom we disagree. 
let's uh, continue that tradition of ours. Being said, we'll go back to go to Article Three. Um, since I, I hated reading out loud when I was in school, so this is an exercise for me to continue my uh, therapy on, on reading aloud. Um, Shell Motors authorized total fund expenditures for operating expenses of $3,072,353.53, of which it is estimated that $1,907,420.03 will be raised by taxes and $1,164,933.50 by non-tax revenues. Eric? Thank you, Dave. And uh, thank everyone for zooming in tonight and welcome. I'm gonna be starting on page 15 if you wanna follow <laughs> along in the town report, as well as I believe Brian's gonna uh, put the budget up on uh, the display and you can follow along that way. I'll be running through the, the same format that I would do in town meeting, uh, just going down through hitting some of the highlights in the budget and then open it up for any questions that any of the voters may have. Uh, this year's budget is not as sexy as previous budget. Uh, we, and that was intentional and purposeful with a couple of reasons. Uh, when we were building the budget, we we're heavy into the COVID as we still are. And we knew some people are struggling. So we wanted to be very uh, purposeful in, in trying to keep the, the, any increases down to as little as possible. And our goal was to be level funded as well as uh, this town is very dependent on a lot of state and federal funding sources and uh, with the state revenue being down, although they've been doing very well, better than they initially anticipated. Uh, so hopefully we will not see any uh, harm from some of our state revenues being uh, affected. So if you, I'm, I'm not sure, Brian, if you can make that any larger, might be. Yeah, I can blow that up. Okay. And, is that how does that look on your screens? A little larger, or is that good? That I think that looks pretty good. Okay, I'm getting a few thumbs up, so I'm, I'm okay. going to go ahead and leave it here. Uh, the first couple of few pages is the summary pages. I'll just hit a couple of items uh, down there at line 121, and I'm not sure if you may have to point it out, Brian. Line 121, the amount to be raised by taxes. The amount to be raised by taxes. Uh, this is what impacts most people. The biggest concern to most people, this is the amount of your tax bill. A year ago in column uh, C E is in easy. We budgeted $1,859,935. Uh, the estimated year end is actually up and a couple of driving forces there as you may recall, uh, re, uh, re recollect last year, the voters voted to increase our budget by 37,500 to be, uh, which came out to be what the Historical Society was paying off their uh, final debt to the town with the historical uh, Holcomb House, as well as a couple of 2,500 miscellaneous expense so our total year end estimate for the amount to be raised by taxes is $1,901,659. And follow on to the next column, column G. This is our budget. That's 1907420000 So basically it's about $6,000 increase uh, over previous year's actual, which is virtually uh, no increase. Continue on down all the way to the end of that summary page, uh, line 421. And the total budget number, you can see, uh, go over to column F, the, uh, that's the actual. Back up one column is column E is what we had budgeted. 
and column G is the budget number that we're proposing. It's a, uh, a slight decrease over our actual for the for the prior year. So now move on into the uh, the meat of it. With the can you go to the next page? Okay, are you there? Okay, first one is light in five. Uh, like I said, current taxes. That's if you go all the way over to the column G is $1,907,420. That would come out to be approximately 82.5 cents on the grand list, which is very, very close to what uh, you had last year. And I'll show you how that impacts you later. If you uh, move on down to line 26, that's uh, state and federal revenues. I'm not going to go through each one of them, but if you go down to line 35, the subtotal and all the way over to column G, you can see the impact that state and federal revenue has on our budget, um, just a little over $600,000. So that is a huge amount. And that's one of the reasons the board was uh, you know, cautious in, in what we were budgeting or proposing for a budget. Okay. Move on down to column 42, or line 42, I mean. And this is just the revenue highway restricted fund. This is a money in, money out. Over here on the far right, column G, we're bringing in 194,100. And what that is for is part of our capital equipment fund, or. Uh, uh, plan this year we're going to be replacing one of the 7600 trucks which is one of the large uh, tandem axled dump trucks the big ones as well as one of the or the only uh, smaller dump truck the 4300 that you see that maintains basically mostly the village high uh, uh, roads within the village so that's a uh, is part of our plan to replace those two. It's money brought in and then there's money that uh, goes out for spending. So it doesn't impact our bottom line. It's just money in, money out. Uh, move on down to line 49, the bridge reserve fund. This is money we're bringing into our budget from our bridge reserve fund of 35,000. And that would be an estimate of the work we need to do on the Scribner Bridge. Uh, again, that is an estimate and uh, very rough that if the money, if it actually costs more than that, it's uh, just money we pull in from our reserve fund and spend out. So it'll still won't impact the bottom line, just be money in money out. Uh, line 54, Revenue reappraisal fund over on column G, you'll see there's, we do not plan to take any out of the reserve fund. This reserve fund has been uh, uh, one that we've been pulling out of annually for the last few years with the uh, assessors that we had and the thought we could uh, have by having a rolling reappraisal, we wouldn't have to have a, a townwide reappraisal done in one big swoop and uh, so we could spend that money out of there and help offset some of the costs of hiring assessors versus the listers on um, why we're stopped taking it out is it is pretty depleted but uh, our contract with the assessors has uh, will be ending this june 1st and they have expressed uh, interest in not renewing with us so depending on who we get if they if we get somebody who does not do a rolling reappraisal, we would be looking at some point down the road, 10 years, five years, 15. It just all depends on our uh, CLA and, and uh, if we get out of sync with what the market's driving. That cost of doing a town-wide reappraisal, the last time we uh, did one about 
15 years ago, it was just north of 100,000. So any guess is good, but I would say it's probably closer to 200,000 or more now. So we're gonna to have to start contributing back into that reserve fund. Uh, moving on down through to line 119. We anticipate over in column G to bring 100,000 in on our estimated cash on hand to help reduce taxes. So this is directly reducing the amount that we need to raise from property taxes. Uh, drop down a couple of lines and there's the figure for the amount to be raised from property taxes. And below that is the total revenue, $3,072,000. Now we'll move over into the expense side. Uh, first item, I'll just point it out, line 126, board salaries. It's not a large amount, however, Typically, this particular uh, item is voted on by the voters at town meeting. We have a question, uh, an article that goes something like, uh, will the voters uh, provide compensation to the select board? And if so, how much? Well, obviously in Australian ballot, you can't uh, have a question like that. So what we did is we just budgeted that we would uh, continue the rate as was approved last year. And that would be a total of 6,300. Uh, moving on to line 157, which is the Lister's contracted services. You see we had uh, last year in column E, we had budgeted 32,000. That's been bumped up to 50,000 for the proposed budget. And that again is because the company that uh, we had a six year contract with them and they expressed no, not having interest in renewing it. So uh, we ex do expect that will be a higher price than what we did have before. Um, a lot of the rest of the budget for a while is just some tweaking small amounts up or down. Some of the other uh, inputs from other boards and commissions into our budget. And basically if we move all the way down into the highway budget is where we really have the first thing of any notable amount that I wanted to at least highlight. And that would be line 382. Okay, uh, bridges, contracted services, and we have budgeted 35,000. And if you remember, that's the 35,000 that we showed coming in as revenue. And that would be going towards the Scribner Bridge. The next item, 383 Bridge Culvert Reserve Fund. <clears throat> in column F, 37,500. This is where we're showing the money that the voters uh, upped our budget by last year to take the 75,000 from the Historical Society and put it towards our covered bridges. And because we didn't spend money in our current uh, budget on the covered bridges, uh, we're showing it going into the reserve fund and then we'll pull it out as we need to. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the first 37,500 for the current budget is going into the uh, reserve fund and we're proposing the next 37,500 to be go in there as well. And that's in next year's budget. That is money we have not received yet from the Historical Society, but we do anticipate that after July 1st. And that will be the total amount, <clears throat> excuse me, that the Historical Society will be given the town. Line 394, which is the uh, purchase large equipment capital. And that's the 181,000 that I mentioned before that is going towards uh, the new dump trucks, the large uh, tandem as well as the single axle. 395 is where we show money going into that capital reserve fund. We put in so much every year so that uh, we can take it out and there's no fluctuation in hits to the taxpayers 
it's all a consistent amount. It is slightly going up uh, about $7,000 and it will be increasing fairly steadily over the next few years, just due to increased costs of the, the equipment with the increases we're seeing. That brings us down to uh, line 421, which is the total budget. And that matches up with the revenue, $3,072,354. Now, I'm not sure if you have the rest of the pages, Brian. Um, yep. uh, okay. Which one do you, do you want to so see? Continue on to page 29. It's just uh, all of the reserve cash on hand and where some of it's reserved out. And I'm gonna have to blow that up a little bit. And just, I just wanted to note down the very bottom under proposed reservations, it shows uh, to reduce taxes FY22 budget 100,000. That's the 100,000 we showed being brought in to uh, reduce the amount to be raised by taxes. And if we continue on a couple of pages, page 31, which is the uh, estimated tax rate. And let's see a couple of lines down, estimated FY22. It's highlighted there, rate proposed budget. It's 82.8257. That would be the tax rate that would be going on, uh, our estimated tax rate for uh, property taxes. As I've said in prior years, it is an estimate because April 1st is when the uh, assessors uh, start the uh, uh, grand list and we don't set the grand list until the June timeframe. And that's when we have a finalized uh, tax rate number. But as I'm not off the top of my head aware of any uh, significant development or significant uh, removals from the grand list, I would not anticipate it would move that much. And uh, lastly, I just did want to point out on the next page, which is the, uh, the capital equipment reserve fund, as well as the plan for when items would be, it's a little bit busy. Uh, line 23, if you followed across, it just shows our annual contribution. And like I said, that would be increasing some over the next few years. And line 29 and 31 are the two vehicles that we have uh, proposed to be replaced. And Dave, I think that about covers what I wanted to hit for highlights. I guess I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. Which means that I in turn hand it back to Brian to see if he has someone who wants to address all this. All right, so this would be opportunity for comments and questions about the annual budget. Uh, so if anybody has questions, uh, raise your hand. Um, I'm not seeing anybody. We don't have anybody on the phone. Star nine. Yeah, star nine if you're on the phone, but I don't think anybody is on phone. So um, I, I guess we're all set. We always Walter? come back. <laughs> Where's Walter? <laughs> That's a good question. I, Walter, where where is? I, I think I can answer that question. Uh, he is away, I believe, for some kind of a family emergency. Oh, okay. Too bad. I, uh, <clears throat> just as a side comment, and Johnson, ever since I've gone to town meeting, has always been at least one extremely well-informed budget critic. Mm -hmm. And I've always felt that uh, whoever that is or was, uh, was an extremely valuable resource to the community. And, um, 
So I, I wasn't being flip about Walter. I think Walter you know, really does help us out and does you know keep our feet to the fire on a number of uh, important issues. So <clears throat> that being said, uh, yes, is our anything? If there's nothing further, Brian, on your screen. No, I still don't have any hands up. So okay, then we have. That all the information we're going to have on the budget. We thank Eric for his usual clear, thorough presentation. And I guess we'll move on to articles uh, four through eight. <clears throat> and they are the uh, support of um, various charitable entities uh, in this. <clears throat> Case Lamoille Home Health and Hospice, uh, Clarina Howard Nichols, uh, Red Cross, uh, North Central Vermont Recovery Center, and Salvation Farms. Um, anyone have any questions on any of those proposals? Uh, I want to point out first that uh, four, five, and six are increases to. Uh, Charities that we already work with, six and seven, or excuse me, seven and eight are new charities that we haven't worked with in the past. Okay. And uh, I do have uh, Teresa Snow from Salvation Farms to speak to their request. Okay, so I will call on Teresa right now. Great, can everybody hear me? Yes, yes you can. Yes. Wonderful. Um, so I'm Teresa Snow. I am the founder and executive director for Salvation Farms. We are a nonprofit organization based in Morrisville. And um, this coming uh, fiscal year, we have approached several towns in the Lamoille Valley uh, to seek support from the taxpayers. Um, what we're asking from Johnson is $700 to support our Lamoille Valley Gleaming Program. And what our Gleaming Program has done and continues to do um, is collect high quality surplus produce from Lamoille Valley farms that they don't have markets for. And we move that to community based programs that feed um, many of your neighbors. Uh, and in this last year, uh, we moved, uh, for example, to the Johnson Emergency Food Shelf, um, more than 1,500 pounds of Lamoille Valley grown produce that farmers couldn't sell. Um, we engage volunteers across the valley. This last year, we engaged 142 volunteers that contributed um, more than 550 hours, helping us collect that food from farms. Uh, and also help distribute that to uh, agencies throughout the valley. Other places that we move this food to include Lairway Youth and Family Services, Teen Challenge, Cambridge um, Community Food Shelf, Lamoille Community Food Share, Meals on Wheels, uh, and the list goes on. We serve roughly um, 39 different uh, organizations throughout Lamoille Valley and even some senior sites uh, in the um, in the Northeast Kingdom. So uh, again, this is the first time we've ever approached any town in the Valley to support our work. Uh, and we deliver these services uh, at no cost to all of our partners. Uh, we do this in service to our, our region's farms and, and, and to our neighbors. So thank you for considering this request. Thank you, Thank you Teresa. Any representatives of uh, the other? Uh, I don't believe that I have anybody else. Um, well, then, do we have any questions? Not sure to whom they would be directed, but does anyone else <laughs> want to address this, uh, these articles? Yeah, I do have a little bit more information about each one having received their written requests. So if anybody does want more details, I can do my best to provide. Uh, 
the blue hands at rest? It appears so. Okay. Well, Teresa, thank you for coming by. You've distinguished yourself from you know, some other folks, uh, as usual, I might add. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for coming. And stay on if you'd like. Um, I think that will take care of um, four to eight, unless someone has something they'd like to offer. Seeing none, Brian? No, I don't see anybody. Okay, then let's go on to the really interesting <laughs> collection of taxes article, article nine, which I will not read to you. Um, <laughs> I could, but I won't. Uh, does anyone have uh, any questions or comments on uh, Article 9? Dave, can I just make a general comment? Sure. OK. Uh, just for everyone's awareness, the select board has not taken a, an official position on any of these articles with the exception of our own uh, budget, Article 3. So there is no board position official on any of the articles uh, with the exception of that. Uh, this particular one, I would just say that uh, it's one that we've been, it's been recommended to, the, to us to always post every year and that's why you do see it. And I would just add that uh, there is two articles uh, next, then the next two are binding articles. And what that means is uh, the vote of the voters on that town meeting day, uh, that those will be binding. And the legislature, when they uh, to, uh, made up the option, to, uh, the opt-in option for cannabis uh, gave the power to the voters and only the voters, the legislative body select board does not have any say for or against or any authority to make or not make this happen. So it is totally up to the voters on those two articles. And then the last few or uh, three articles are non-binding. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Returning to article nine, going, going, gone. Oh, I don't see any comments on article nine. Um, and it's gone. Yeah, moving on. Article 10. Um, 10 and 11. Um, yes, I can read, read them for you. Uh, shall the voters approve the establishment and operation of cannabis retailers within the town of Johnson, subject to regulation by the Vermont Cannabis Control Board and the town of Johnson Select Board, acting as the local cannabis control commission? That was Article 10. Article 11, shall the voters approve the establishment and operation of integrated licenses within the town of Johnson, subject to regulation by the Vermont Cannabis Control Board and the town of Johnson Slope Board acting as a local cannabis control commission. And I guess preliminarily, I would invite someone familiar with those articles to explain what they are and what the distinctions are from you know, Article 10 from 11. All right. Uh, I'm going, I'm going to suggest that we recognize Jess Bigford uh, as kind of a local authority on this and uh, Shane Spence, uh, or could be Athena, um, to also speak on it. Uh, Jessica, why don't we start with you? Hello, thank you. Um, so there's Act um, Article 10 and 11 are both part of Act 164, uh, which was done at the state level uh, in the fall. Uh, it passed without the governor's signature. Um, and what that act did was it opted, it gave towns the, the opportunity to opt in to retail cannabis only. It's not talking about, at least for Article 10, uh, it's not talking about growing or packaging, distributing, any of that. It's just the retail environment. Um, and basically um, throughout this next year, uh, the st state uh, is going to put into place a cannabis control board. 
Um, they're running about two months behind schedule. And that cannabis control board is going to really put into place the rules that the retail markets will be needing to abide by. Um, currently um, at the town level, we don't know what those rules are. Um, and so that is still forthcoming. Um, there's also additional legislation coming to clarify some of the, the gray areas of Act 164. Um, and so that's, both of these are a little vague right now. Um, we'll have more clarity. It is important to note that if we vote no now, we can turn around next year and put it on again. Um, so when we have more information, um, so that doesn't close the door forever, um, which is a concern for some people. Um, also to note um, is that the state uh, Act 164, no licenses will be issued until, uh, well, there's two types of licenses, um, but the general licenses will not be issued um, until October um, 2022. So there is time on this. Um, so that's that. That's Article 10. Article 11 is related to integrated licenses, and currently under Act 164, there's five integrated licenses allowed in the state, uh, and those are for the current medical uh, cannabis dispensaries to be able to set up a retail um, environment as well. So currently, that doesn't necessarily apply to us. It would only apply in the future if they were to expand integrated. Um, and integrated basically means that somebody could grow, uh, package, distribute, uh, be their own testing site. And so it's a, a vertical integration. Um, so there's, there's um, those are the two things. Um, I think often we think of, you know, Vermont, you know, let's, let's grow it and then sell it, um, you know, which is what we do with our farmer's markets all of the time. Um, there's definitely a lot more, um, regulation that's going to be put in place on on growers um, and that will be decided by the state. Um, so that's that's a, a snapshot of all the nuances of Act 164. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. And now uh, uh, I've got Shane Spence or Athena Park. If you're ready for them, Dave? Yes. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, this is Shane Spence. Um, so Jess did a great job explaining uh, the rundown of uh, Act 164 and the um, split between the two questions. Uh, I, I, I brought this forward um, not really knowing that things were a couple months behind schedule as far as the statewide uh, board was concerned and thinking, you know, we should probably get ahead of this. This is something that's that's coming our way, whether we uh, like it or not. I know there's there's people on either side of this issue in the community, um, but the only way that we have some sort of local control over this issue and, and how it comes to our town is if we take proactive steps to do so. So um, I thought getting this question on the ballot is one way to do that. Um, and I think even if we don't have all of the answers, um, it's a good conversation for us to have. Um, so like Jess said, you know, not the end of the world for people to vote no on it. Um, but even if we vote yes, it's not something that, you know, starts any, you know, kickstarts any process that's going to, uh, you know, create all sorts of work for us. It's just a conversation that we're going to have to have as a town over the next couple of years. So um, I won't take up too much time because I think she did a great job explaining it. Great. Thank you, Shane. All right. I've got Nat Kinney up next. Go ahead, Nat. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I'm speaking only for myself here. As Eric said, the select board has not taken a position on this article. Um, the um, as Jess Bickford said, the um, Cannabis Control Board uh, is running behind. In the best case scenario, um, final adoption of rules regarding cannabis establishments would not, not be set until March of 2022. Um, so my preference would be to know what the rules are before opting in. 
um, and not opt in and then find out what the rules are. So I think um, regardless of how this goes down, this particular vote, that the select board should probably set up a local cannabis control commission so that the town can have the, the discussion internally. Um, so my, my preference would be to, to, to get that commission going this year, have this vote at the next town meeting. Um, and, and in so doing, we'll be delaying our vote, but we would not be delaying the, the, the licensing of any potential establishments because those licenses won't even begin to start um, being um, given out until um, I believe October, 2022. So I just feel like this is very premature and let's, let's find out what the statewide rules are first and then opt in. Thanks very much. Thank you, Matt. All right, Casey Romero, I've got you up next. Go ahead, Casey. Yeah, question for Shane. Uh, this I believe was your petitions that, that, that are behind these articles from, I remember that I think from previous discussion. Uh, Dave, I'll look for your guidance on this. Yeah, yeah, you can open this mic for that. Okay. Please. All right, Shane, if you'd like, you can unmute. Um, I will this time. I am eating dinner. So uh, yes, it is. It was <laughs> my um, initiative. I, I brought it forward to Brian. Um, there was no petition drive this year due to COVID. Uh, but I, you know, brought the, the question to Brian of what would this type of ballot question look like? And then it went from there. Okay, because um, especially I, I'm, then I'm addressing this in, to the group in general, but really also particularly for you since you know you, you have a driving force and interest in the topic, um, which is that uh, before town meeting, it would be really good to hear again, really clear, really simple uh, reasons repeated as to why it, it, it really makes sense kind of to postpone this and therefore vote no. Um, and it would be particularly valuable, uh, Shane, coming from you because, you know, you were kind of the force behind getting these articles here. And I, I do remember the discussion about, oh my God, they came out really different than I intended. <laughs> I, you know, I, I believe you wanted to withdraw them and so forth. Uh, I think that's valuable information. So that that was that's my request. Thanks. Oh, and, and this is Casey Romero. Thank you, Casey. All right. Uh, next up, I've got Kyle Noose. Go ahead, Kyle. Hi. Great. Thank you. Um, yes, Kyle Noose here. I just a clarification point. I'm I'm just um, just. I guess, Ann Shane, when you say it's two months behind, I think leg those legislators have only been in um, session for about two months. So, so does that mean that they have not even talked about this or taken it off the board or whatever, whatever happens um, on that front to get it going? And then my second question is, it was my understanding a few months ago, and I don't know if this is still true, um, that at any point, this does not, opting in does not require a town-wide vote, although that's, I think, ideal. Um, but at any point, the select board um, can pick this topic up and vote on it just as a board. So I'm wondering if anyone can um, uh, let me and others know if that's still the case. Thank you. Uh, I think Jess is ready to speak on this. Uh, if you're all right with that, yeah. David. Yes, Jess, go ahead. Um, so the, the good questions. Um, so the first question about being a couple months behind, um, the basically some names were put forth for the Cannabis Control Board at the state level uh, to the governor. Um, and that board was set to uh, convene in January. And that whole process is what's behind. Um, so that board mm -hmm. yet been named or convened. Uh, there's separate legislative processes that are like in the works to try to, to isolate and articulate better pieces of um, 
of Act 164 for clarification's sake. Um, and that began after the legislative session came into being. Um, as far as the way Act 164 specifically reads is it does have to be a town vote. And that could be at a town meeting, it could be a separate special vote, um, but it, it is not up to uh, the select board uh, to vote yay or nay on this. It is specifically uh, in statute that it has to go um, before the, the full voting body. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kyle, does that cover both ends of your questions? It does. Thank you very much. Yeah. Ryan? I'm not seeing anybody else right now, but if you do have questions, we'll be happy to take them. Um, yeah, I want to thank, take a minute to thank uh, Jess and Shane for kind of being our, our subject matter experts on this that, uh, you know, uh, been very well informed and, and followed this closely. Um, okay. So. Still uh, no blue hands? Nope, I don't have anybody with their hands up. So we can okay. move on. So move it along. Uh, Article 12, shall the select board enter into discussions with the village of Johnson trustees with regard to possible merger of the town and village? Anyone care to take that up and explain the whys of this? You want me to take the first stab at this? Sure, Eric. Okay. Uh, if everyone looks at the back and it's the very back of the town report that's been sent out, uh, there is a, the report that came in from the consultant. Uh, this was a request of the voters, uh, I believe a couple of years ago for both the town select board and the village trustees by their voters that we uh, hire a consultant and get these kind of answers and a study done. So the study is now before the voters. The select board is not taking a, an official position on this. Uh, we really just encourage the voters to review the report and vote with their conscience. Any further comment or question? Give everybody a couple minutes. I was trying to find the button there. Okay, Linda. All right, go ahead, Linda. So do the village voters have the same question coming up at their village meeting? They are expected to. They might have uh, a slightly different wording on it. Uh, there was some, still some questions about if they wanted to phrase it exactly the same as ours or not, uh, but they were, they'll be asked virtually the same question, if not exactly the same. So if either the village or the town says no, is that, is it dead then? Or what happens then? Basically, you're correct. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it takes two to tango. And if one of us doesn't want to dance, there's no dance. Hmm. All right. That's it, I guess. Thank you, Linda. All right, Athena, oh. Athena and Shane. Hi, it's uh, Athena this time, Athena Park here. Um, I would just like to clarify that uh, we do have um, this question on the ballot and, and Brian is right, there might be slightly different language, but our, our intention is to keep it um, absolutely the same. And uh, the board also takes no uh, position either way. I'd just like to clarify that the village trustees have no official position uh, on this question. Thank you. Thank you, Athena. All right, I don't see anybody else. We'll give people a second to find the button. If they do have comments. Three, two, one, zero. Not seen any. Okay, 
So we'll go on to articles 13 and 14, and they regard the uh, repeal of the, well, shall the select board repeal the ordinance regulating all-terrain vehicles? That's 13 and 14, shall the select board undertake comprehensive evaluation of the environmental impacts of all-terrain vehicle use on class four roads in the town of Johnson. Um, questions or comments? Uh, I guess we can start it out with a little overview on what these articles mean um, and a little bit of the history of how we got here. We, we received uh, four requested questions uh, for this and we found two of the four to be uh, a little bit too much of a stretch to adapt them to uh, well-formed questions for that were appropriate for uh, Australian ballot. So uh, we're left with these two. Uh, the first one, uh, again, these are advisory questions, one asking us to repeal the ordinance and one asking us for a study of environmental impacts on class four roads by ATVs. I think that kind of brings us up to the, up to speed. Uh, so we'll take other comments. All right. I have uh, Kirsten up first. Hello. Kirsten Owen. Yeah. Hi, this is Kirsten Owen. Yes. Hello. I would like to explain the backstory for this petition, Article 14. Um, at town meeting July 20th, well, which is the to, to undertake an environmental, uh, to look at the environmental impacts of ATVs on class four roads. At town meeting July 20th, 2020, Brian's story, you announced, quote, we are going to have a greater requirement for improvements on class four roads specific to hydrologically connected road segments. Unquote, end quote. All studies on ATVs point to increased runoff and soil erosion, devegetation and habitat destruction. Now, with greatly increased ridership, one of our community members who lives on a back road counted 70 in one day. Why not include the impacts of ATVs in the already existing required surveys? I think that there's a possibility of getting a grant and I think it could be a really good um, way to be protective of the road segments with hydro hydrological connections. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. All right, if you're all set, then I've got Neil Shepard up next. Neil? Okay, go ahead, Neil. Yeah. My, I'm unmuted. Hi. Yeah. So just, I won't take up too much time, but just to maybe create some context, as most of you who I'm looking at uh, know, back in 2006, the town of Johnson was wrestling with this new issue, whether or not to allow ATVs on the town roads. And we had a special vote. It was very close. There were over a hundred people on either side of the issue which suggested you know, that there was some polarity around it. The pro ATV um, riders uh, won the vote and the select board then, uh, I guess uh, at that point or before that point had already created an ordinance, but the ordinance was passed and ATV riders have been on our town roads ever since. And so it's been a 15 year experiment more or less um, to, and the people who I think are concerned about ATVs on our roads um, have seen an uptick in the number of ATVs. They're bigger, um, there's more noise. We worry about safety issues. We worry about enforcement and other things. And so I, we feel that it's time 
to revisit the issue, uh, revisit the ordinance. And so uh, this is uh, Article 13 in particular, shall we repeal the ordinance regulating uh, the ATVs. And if there's a large majority voting against ATVs on the town roads, we hope the select board will consider repealing the ordinance and that will keep ATVs off the roads. If there's a close vote, which I guess I expect there will be, I hope it will encourage um, the select board to um, either by themselves or with an advisory committee, um, uh, look at uh, the issue afresh and uh, have people from both sides and people maybe who are um, sort of uh, neutral about it all get together in an advisory committee and uh, we are composed of maybe 10, 12 people, I don't know how many, but I hope that they will be able to uh, create um, a new order in, ordinance that finds a palatable compromise. Um, that's, I think that's, that's my hope at least, that uh, depending on the vote, uh, we either um, repeal them from riding on the roads altogether or we try to revisit it and find some kind of compromise that takes into account both sides of the issue. Thanks. Thank you, Neil. Brian? I don't have anybody up next. Okay, uh, Casey has raised her hand. Okay, Casey. Uh, yeah, uh, I put this in a, a front porch forum post, but I'll repeat it again here, is I think, I believe this problem may well be bigger than Johnson, uh, because as I looked at the little map of trails, uh, ATV trails, Johnson is like the crossroads pinch point where people on either side who want to go beyond their town, they have to go through Johnson. And I wonder if in fact, that's part of what's increasing the traffic and the noise and you know the increased uh, problems for quality of peaceful enjoyment of one's home uh, for people that are having those problems. So uh, my point is um, I, I, I strongly favor having some sort of committee or advisory group as Neil was saying, because uh, I don't want the bur the Johnson shouldn't be burdened with the solution alone, you know? we don't have power over, say, requiring uh, ATVs to have better mufflers or, you know, factors. Um, I'm, I'm sure that they'll, there will be a, a compromise coming out of this that, hope, you know, that will allow riders to continue riding while things are being looked at. Um, but I just, I mean, it, I look at it and I see so many factors that are beyond Johnson's control. And we need to know, perhaps in conjunction with the uh, VASA, I guess it is, uh, who these uh, ATV Riders Association, whatever that the initials stand for, um, you know, we, we need to work in conjunction with a bunch of entities outside of Johnson. So that's my point. Thanks. Thank you, Casey. All right, I don't have anybody else up right now. Joanne? See you. Lois? Uh, Lois got her hand up. Okay, I've got Joanne and then Lois will call on you after Joanne. Yeah, Joanne. Okay, okay you'll have to unmute yourself, Joanne. Okay. There you go. Um, am I allowed to uh, just make a statement about something that has nothing to do with the budget or the town meeting? Um, we're really on the business of the ATVs right now. 
okay. uh, if it doesn't have anything to do with the ATVs, I believe there'll be an opportunity for additional comments afterwards. Okay, great. Yeah, that's, that's correct. So okay. Let's uh, finish up with the ATVs and then we'll move on. And it, it, it kind of sounds like maybe we are finished with the ATVs at this point. Lois did have her hand up. Oh, okay. Uh, Lois. Yes, your mic's open. Thank you. I just wanted to um, give a little historical perspective because I think it can be relevant now. I was on the committee in 2006 and the, the committee worked very hard. And in the end, the committee decided not to put forward the ordinance for the reason, one reason was that there was no developed trail system at that time. There was no way for anybody to, to ride on private land or public land. And so that committee um, turned over their findings to the select board and the select board at the time had a member who had written another ordinance and so the ordinance passed. But I think that piece of knowing the trail system is still missing. I went online to try to get a map of where you could ride an ATV and I came up with that I had to be a member in order to get a map. And so communication is a huge, huge problem as far as I'm concerned. People come into town and you know, they're parking roads all over the place, they may or may not even know where to go. So I, you know, I, I think that it's important to have this opportunity for people that the um, association has been wonderful over the years in um, pitching in on Cotting Hollow Road when things went awry and working with um, the Conservation Commission and the Select Board in fixing problems. So the pieces are in place. We just have to figure out how to pull them together so that there's balance and everybody gets to have peace and quiet in the good riding time. And it can be done. Thank you. Thank you, Lois. All right. Uh, I don't have any other hands up for the ATV ordinance. Uh, we'll give it a couple seconds, but. Okay. And finally, I said if we have the time and energy, I'll invite any other comments concerning town matters not previously discussed, which I guess plays right into Joanne's court. There you um, go. Okay. Uh, I, I noticed at the candidates meeting the other night, I, I just, uh, I've worked at the colleges for, for two, 23 years and um, and I'm more familiar with the college than than the town but I, I had the impression from that meeting that um, there were a, a fair amount of people that really weren't aware of how poorly funded the colleges are and I, I, I just wanted to just make a little statement about it. Um, when, when Vermont combined the state colleges into one system that was 1961 the statute said, and it still says that, that the system would be supported in whole or in substantial part with state funds. And the state did fund the system uh, about 50% of its, of its budget when it first formed. But starting in the early 1970s, Vermont chose to start lowering the, the funding to the state colleges. And, um, and in the 23 years that I've worked at, at the college, we were always struggling for funds. And we were always at either the bottom or second from the bottom in uh, state funding countrywide. And, and because of the funding, it's at last I knew it was 17 or 18% of, of the budget that is funded by the state instead of the 50% that was intended. Um, and because of that, the tuition is the highest in the country for a public institution. And, and I just, I'm, I'm just not sure that the townspeople, that not all townspeople are aware of that. And I think that that's an important piece of information to know if, 
if we come into another disaster with uh, thoughts about closing the college again. That's really all I wanted to say. Thank you, Joanne. Yeah, I, I see you getting a lot of applause from our board and a lot of our, our our town, I think, does recognize the hardship that the college is under. And like you said, Vermont is one of the, uh, Vermont contributes some of the least to its uh, higher education system. Uh, and that should always be a part of our conversation when we're talking about uh, the future of NVU. I, I would, I would just add to that that uh, probably for the first time since the early '70s, uh, the legislature, you know, has begun to show signs of interest in this issue, and uh, to the extent that uh, they have expressed that interest, uh, I think a lot of it was in response to the. Uh, groundswell of support for NVU that uh, was demonstrated after the suggestion was made to close three of the colleges. Um, I think it would be useful, you know, if this is an issue in which you have interest, this is a time when the legislature is actually seriously thinking about the state college system, and you might want to keep in touch with your representatives to. Uh, make sure they're aware of the community's interest. Oh, thank you again. Yeah. Uh, and then I've got Casey. Casey. Yes, Casey Romero. And uh, this going goes directly back to actually the town meeting report. Uh, and I have to say, I was delighted to see that it was dedicated to Eric. I loved reading the page. I wished it had gone on longer. Uh, mm -hmm. And they missed the point, the, an accolade that I would give you, which is that you are a great speaker at a funeral. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, mean, that's who you want Eric to speak about you at your funeral, because you've got, I mean, it, it's a sweet, kind, loving, personal touch and you're great at it. <laughs> um, thank you. I'm done. <laughs> Are you gonna be circulating a sign-up sheet, Eric? <laughs> yes, I will be. <laughs> uh, I, I will just say uh, the town report, maybe a lot of people don't realize this, but the town report is actually the auditor's report. And uh, while there's a lot of things in it that the select board certainly uh, contributes to, and, and we actually usually uh, throw some names at, to the auditors with suggestions on who they ought to consider to uh, dedicate the town report to. However, in the end, it is their decision. And uh, I said this at the select board level the other night, uh, we have a very uh, sly, but yet dedicated and loyal, and I can't say enough good things about the town clerk that we have. Uh, Rosemary, Rosemary is one of those people that has the integrity of no one else. She knows every secret in the town and village because she doesn't say anything. She don't repeat anything. If you ever need to talk to somebody confidential, you talk to Rosemary because you don't have to worry about it going anywhere. Well, it also comes back because I threw the name to Rosemary, uh, who I thought you know, ought to be considered some names. And uh, the auditors were not coming in this year because of COVID-19. And Rosemary just said, oh, they've already got somebody in mind. But, oh, okay. So obviously Rosemary knew that day and she <laughs> can keep a secret like no other. Um, but it really did humble me. I was as shocked and surprised as anybody else when I opened my town report because uh, I didn't know who it was dedicated to. And first, when they got it got posted on the web, oh, I, I wonder who it's post uh, dedicated to. So I went to the website, and it wasn't there. So uh, just like everyone else, I found out when I got it in the mail, and 
it really is an honor and it really humbled me and I am truly, truly appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we've got a couple minutes for any other business. Uh, I see Margo. Okay. Thank you. Um, I hesitate. Maybe this is the right time for me to bring something back around because what we just witnessed with Eric was a wonderful punctuation, I think, to this meeting. It, uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, well deserved. And um, I'm wondering, I'm willing to hear the, the answer no. Can I, I just have a question about articles 13 and 14. Is, has that ship sailed? Has that ATV gone by? Or can I ask a quick question about it? Well, that article, excuse me, articles uh, what, 13 and 14 have gone by. However, uh, other comments concerning matters, well, it says not previously discussed, but I'm sure you're going to discuss some aspect of it that wasn't previously discussed. So I want to go ahead. <laughs> Uh, it's a question. So um, it's uh, just to clarify. So to, a voting of yes on these articles basically really uh, sets the table for um, what was discussed by some others, like in terms of conversation, uh, compromise, really trying to fit work, getting together and work out so the ATVs can, in fact, you know, that ride the roads um, and the trails and that uh, residents can feel, you know, um, good about in terms of noise and how things are just sort of carried out. And that a vote of no might not set the table as well to bring the community together to work this out. So that is that that's a question. Uh, I see. Am I correct in that enough, assumption uh, that yes, it is like opening up, like let's come together and talk. I see well, Nat willing to offer a, an answer. I, I, it sounds like a rhetorical question to me, but um, you know, if, if uh, someone wanted to respond to it, I would certainly recognize them. If not, I would understand. So yep. we've got Nat. Okay. Yep. Um, Distracted by my hand being up, excuse me. Okay. Um, I think either way that this vote goes, these, these two questions, the community is gonna have to have those conversations anyway. And I think, you know, should, should the town decide not to repeal these ordinances. I would, I would anticipate probably, I think it's reasonable to think that um, the, the ATV group will be approaching the select board sometime in the, in the next six to eight to 10 months. And they'll probably ask us if they can expand, you know, have the, the, the special permission that they've gotten to use our village roads Route 15 and, and um, uh, excuse me, Railroad Street. My guess is that they'll ask to either extend the exemption to the ordinance that they've got or to permanently amend the ordinance. Um, so a no vote would set that up to happen, which obviously would require a larger community conversation, right? Because the community <laughs> saying that we will repeal this vote, I think is going to force the conversation anyway, that, that even if we repeal these, um, this, this ordinance, ATVs and Johnson aren't gonna go away. I would anticipate that there would probably be some um, concern. I think before 2006, there was a fair amount of illegal ridership um, and, and we would still have some questions and concerns around enforcement. Um, and noise and, and, and the rest. So I think either result that we should have community conversations um, around these questions. 
I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Nat. Ryan? I don't see any other questions right now. We'll give it a couple of seconds, but okay, Eric? I see Eric. Uh, basically, I just wanted to agree with what Nat said. Uh, I think he's, uh, he's dead on. No matter what action the select board does take uh, following this vote or through the summer, if we expand the ATV ordinance or if we repeal the ATV ordinance, I believe there is enough people on each side that could very easily make the threshold of submitting a petition. And that would require a townwide vote, special town meeting, and the voters will literally decide uh, they will be the ultimate decision makers on whatever we go forward with. So ultimately it will come to the voters and they are the ones that will decide. If I can expand on that. Yeah. Was that a yeah. yes? Yeah. Yeah, and it, you know, I, I think, and I'm not as familiar with the history back in 2006, but it sounds like there was a committee that was put together that um, had some different views and people came together and, and uh, had a proposal for the select board. And at that time, for whatever reason, that proposal and that work was not honored by the select board. And, and I think that was a real mistake back then. I don't, I don't know who all was on the select board or what happened back then, but I do think that, that um, what needs to be different this time is that the select board really needs to um, listen to that committee. Uh, I've got uh, Linda has a comment or a question. Linda. Um, so you said that the ATVs can uh, go on Main Street and Railroad Street. Can they go down Clay Hill? I mean, are they coming from Cotting Hollow? And I don't know where, I have no idea where they're coming from or where they're going, but are they coming from Swamp Road or Cemetery Road or Ben Ober? So will they be coming using Clay Hill as well? No, uh, they currently use part of Gould Hill, uh, as I understand it, to get to Drag Lot Road, which is a class four highway. And what we did was authorize them to continue down uh, Gould Hill, get to Route 15 and from Route 15, uh, they would have to get the state's permission to get to either uh, uh, Railroad Street or uh, the Maple Fields. We did also authorize the, the Railroad Street connection so they would be able to get to that side as well. But those are the only two streets we opened up that are not part of the currently, you know, prior open. And that would be- For, for the current year only, Eric. That yeah. expires at the end of this year, it's just a yeah. trial just a trial basis. So does that um, mean that, have they gotten permission from the state to go down Main Street? I don't know that, I don't know. So if they don't get that permission, it won't, the rest of it really kind of doesn't matter. Right, exactly. Hmm. Okay. I will say that uh, it seems the state has been very, uh, uh, open to allowing ATVs on their state highways. So I don't foresee that they'll have a problem, but that's just a guess. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Uh, and I see uh, Ken who might have an answer for us on that. Ken? Hello. Uh, no, we do not have permission from the state yet. As everything, everything's running slow with COVID. Okay. Thank you, Ken. All right. Anybody else on the board? I Thank don't see anybody. Say again, Matt. Thank you all for being here.
Good to see you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Uh, if this was uh, not enough fun for you, uh, there's another one of these coming up. <laughs> Feel free to join. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thanks, uh, thanks David. Just well, for thanks, the record, David. we're officially uh, uh, ending the select board meeting.